I'm Ben Sutton, CPA and founder of Mizuma. Definition of a deduction and or a write-off for your business is much more broad than it is narrow. So you have one tax return, the Form 1040, but within the 1040 form, there's a Schedule C. You've got kind of two streams of income coming out of the S-Corp. Some payroll, some owner's distribution. All right, welcome everyone. Glad to have you with us for today's webinar, right in the heat and heart of tax season. Hopefully today's topic uh, helps you and us all through this, this process here. My name is Ben Sutton. I'm a CPA here at Mizuma, one of the founders also of uh, nine years ago when we started Mizuma and started uh, striving to help small business owners. Uh, I myself then am kind of in your shoes in that sense and relate to the issues that, that you face. Uh, today's agenda is kind of a different one than we normally do. You know, usually we're focused really heavily on a, on a tax topic, uh, but this one is how to help your accountants help you. Kind of what is, what is that relationship like? What, is, what, what can you do as a small business owner that may not be an accountant or may not know a whole lot about tax law and all that? Uh, what can you do to contribute to the process and make it as uh, smooth for you and your accountant? Um, we're going to kind of cover three quick, three areas uh, of that topic. One is about details and that, you know, to your accountant, details matter. Second topic is, is about how much communication matters. You know, like a marriage, any relationship relies heavily on communication. And then the third area will be kind of what, what you can do to gut check the return and which happens to be how many of the issues, mistakes, errors that might arise in a tax return are found. So starting on this topic of details, um, really there's so much kind of stress over the details in a tax return because the IRS is so difficult to work with, right? The stakes are kind of high when dealing with the IRS. We, as accountants, we want to do everything we possibly can to avoid having to deal with the IRS. Any interaction that you have with the IRS, if you've ever called them, you know the whole times are horrendous. The service, there's no customer service. It's just zero. In fact, I recall having a conversation with a, an IRS agent on the phone and, you know, imagine this if I had called, you know, any other company, large company out there. But this conversation on the phone, I, I finally, you know, waited my 45 to an hour long hold, 45 minutes to an hour long hold time, and got on with the agent. And we start talking about my issue. And in the middle of resolving my issue, her computer starts having problems. And so she is unable to help me. But not only is she unable to, to finish helping me, she's asked, she asked me to stay on the phone so that, I, so that she doesn't receive another call. So I can stay on the phone for her to give her enough time to resolve her computer issue so that she doesn't accidentally get another call and have to tell them that she's having a computer issue. So she's literally relying on me to sit there on the phone and and wait until she fixes her commu uh, computer problem, which, you know, out of the kindness of my heart, I sat there for five minutes, but after that, I was like, you know what, this is a waste of time. You can't help me. I, I got to go. I got to go work on something. The customer service is just not one of the IRS's objectives. And so anytime you're interacting with them, it's a long, drawn-out, complicated process. So we do everything we can to minimize, reduce mistakes, reduce errors, reduce the likelihood of the IRS having a question about a tax return. You know, if we have to amend a tax return because of a mistake that was made, which is, you know, which happens occasionally, uh, the IRS, speaking of that customer service element, they will take eight weeks to process that amended return. So, and, and sometimes eight to 16 weeks, depending on the time of year that you submit it. So that's just the kind of animal that we're dealing with. And therefore, 
we're a little bit anal about getting the details right. So we want to reconcile your bank accounts, your business bank accounts, to the penny. You know, we want everything to be accounted for. We want to capture all of those transactions, the hundreds or thousands of transactions, however many there are. And it's like pulling together a, a huge thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle. All of the transactions, all of the information that we need to go into a tax return, there's hundreds of variables. And so we get super focused on that. And to you as a small business owner, that can kind of seem annoying. <laughs> and, you know, uh, maybe like we're asking for things that aren't important, but really, uh, but really they end up being important uh, if, if anything goes wrong. So there's really three uh, elements, three roles that you have in helping the accountant kind of get through the details. Okay. One is like we harp on all the time separating your business transactions into their own business bank or credit card accounts, right? Isolating the business transactions into their own accounts so that we're keeping the personal and business transactions separate and can uh, quickly identify which transactions need to be incorporated into the business tax return. Okay. Second, so first, separating bank accounts. Second, provide your accountant with that information. So your accountant needs, your bookkeeper and your tax account needs access to the bank transactions. And at Mizuma, we gather that one of two ways, either uh, linking your bank account, which is the best way, uh, going on to the accounting software, entering your credentials, make that link with between your bank and our software so that your bank transactions automatically download. Right. That's the that's the easiest, quickest way. The second way, though, if for some reason the linking isn't working, uh, is to just provide us with bank statements, bank or credit card statements. OK, so either linking the bank account or providing bank statements. Those are the two ways that we're going to get the information we need in order to reconcile and account for all the transactions and aggregate them into your tax return. The third step. Uh, way that you kind of contribute to the detail gathering process is reviewing any unclassified transactions that we might have questions on, right? It's not uncommon for a business owner to write a check and all that it shows on the bank statement or in the transaction that we've downloaded is check 1023. Well, we don't know who that was written to or what it was for. So we'll send a question about that transaction, and without your feedback on that, we're going to be in the dark. So that's step number three. Just to repeat them again, one, separate bank uh, business bank accounts from personal. Two, provide access to those uh, business bank transactions. Three, review and respond to unclassified transaction inquiries. That, those Three simple steps are going to allow us to have a very smooth bookkeeping process and allow us to get everything that we need for the tax return. Because in the end of the day, those transactions are the deductions that are reducing your tax bill. Deductions are the details, right? That's really kind of how to describe it. And so we're, we're trying to get all of that together to help you pay as little taxes as possible. So ultimately, when that accountant's asking for all of this information or, or you know, uh, our interests are aligned. We're just trying to get the details, the deductions all together uh, so that you're paying as little taxes as possible. All right, so enough about the details. Uh, next, on to communication. Communication uh, is so big, especially for a, a remote accounting service, right? Even for a non-remote in-person accounting service it takes a lot of communication, but uh, just like all relationships, the accountant-client relationship is the foundation of it is solid communication. There's no way to replace that exchange of information. So again, when, when the accountant asks for some seemingly insignificant piece of information, do your best to kind of get into, you know, dig into the details and dig up the answer and, and shoot it off to him or her so that they can 
uh, do what they need to do with it, right? And, and providing that feedback or responding to the inquiries from your accountant timely uh, decreases the chance chances of delays. You know, like that thousand piece puzzle. It's like your accountant's putting together a thousand piece puzzle. And if you've ever done a puzzle, there's kind of that momentum that builds, right? Like you start focusing in and you're, you're getting like better at putting this puzzle together. Well, that's kind of what it is. And if the accountant is waiting on pieces and has to push that puzzle aside and come back to it two, three weeks later, figuring out where they were and everything that, you know, all the uh, process they were going through, it takes extra time and delays the process. So um, making timely responses will, uh, for communication will greatly expedite the, the process and, and decrease the chance for delaying uh, whatever it is you're waiting on from your accountant. Okay, the third area uh, is gut checks. You know, you, you have an accountant. We all, we all know you have an accountant so that you don't have to be one, right? So that you don't have to dig through all those details. That's the point, right? You shouldn't need a degree in accounting in order to run your own business. But you do have a perspective, a, a, a knowledge and understanding of your financial situation that no one else has, right? Your accountant, no matter how smart they are, they are not as into the day-to-day -day of your business activity as you are. And while an, a, a bank transactions and bank activity are, are a hard, fast uh, reflection of what's happened in your business, there's some interpretation that's going on in the process of gathering and processing that information. So you, but, but you will know what's happening with your pocketbook, right, better than anybody else as far as how much money you're getting out of this business, how much money you, you think you've collected from customers, uh, you've got a general feel for what's going on, right? So your review sometimes makes all the difference. Even if you get a tax return uh, from your accountant and you, you're looking at it and you don't really understand what it's talking about or what what this line means, what that line means, or what that number is. As you look at it and try and just do your best to, to piece it together, your gut's going to tell you if something seems off. You know, if, you, if the tax bill is a lot higher than you were expecting, then it's possible that something's wrong and you should ask the question, right, so that the accountant can get that feedback from you and start looking into why it may be different than what you were expecting. Sometimes taxes just are higher than what we're expecting, um, especially if we're new in business and, and haven't really experienced it yet. But a, a lot of times, if, it's, if it doesn't look right, then it probably isn't. So uh, don't hesitate to just turn on your brain for five or ten minutes and, and look through that tax return and just see if something stands out to you that's, that's wrong. It, at the end of the day, uh, you have to sign the tax return, right? The, the accountant is preparing it and filing it for you, but it's your tax return. And so you and, and that's why you should never have an accountant uh, file a tax return until you've signed it because you do need the opportunity to review it. And really, you, you will catch any big mistakes that way. And so uh, that's, uh, that's my last point for you there on, on just doing a gut check, doing a smell test, making sure that things look right when the tax return's done or your, your bookkeeping reports are coming back to you. So I hope those that discussion about just the details matter, communication matters, and that your review, your gut check that you're doing on the information matters. Those are the three ways that you can kind of be involved in the process and really help things go smoothly. All right. Well, don't forget that, you know, Mazuma, our goal is to take as much of that burden off of your, your shoulders as possible. We can't do it without your involvement. 
but we're going to try and involve you as, as little as we have to do in order to get to an accurate, good result. Uh, we're doing bookkeeping for you. We're doing your tax planning and, and providing tax advice, particularly for Business Plus clients that, that uh, get their tax discussion and, and uh, estimated liability and, and all of that through uh, and, and working with the tax professional and drive the tax, tax bill down. Uh, we're also preparing and filing your, your business and personal returns, business returns only for the business basic plan. We're doing all that for a flat monthly fee, which we work really hard to keep that fee as low as possible. And I hope, I hope, you're, I hope that's what you're experiencing. So now let's open it up for any uh, questions that you might have. And I'm happy to address any any questions that pertain to what we were talking about today, or anything that uh, is outside of what we talked about today. Just ones that you may have about your specific situation. All right, let's see here. First question: What are the most common errors you see on business tax returns? Well, when when a client is preparing a business tax return, um, there's often mistreatment of uh, balance sheet transactions, I'll call them. So maybe money coming into the, the company that should not be classified as income, like maybe a loan or an equity contribution from an owner. Uh, those are not should not be classified as income. If, if you don't know that, you know, sometimes small business owners don't realize that and they'll, they'll record that loan or that equity contribution from the owner in as income. Uh, others, again, are maybe payments on loans they'll record as an expense or payments to the owners of the business they'll record as an expense. Um, which should not be the case if, if they're not on payroll. So um, other, other, those are some of the ones that come to mind. Most of the time we don't see small business owners themselves preparing their own uh, business tax return, um, but, but those are some of the errors we do find. Okay, next question. Now that I own a business, will there be any changes in doing my taxes? Yeah, so uh, businesses, once you own a business, you have to file taxes for that business and file a tax return for that business activity. Um, and how you do that depends on the type of entity you have. So a sole proprietor, if, if you are a sole proprietor, uh, meaning you haven't formed an LLC, you haven't formed a corporation or anything, you're just out there doing business under your own name or under a DBA or something, then you will file your business income and expense records on Schedule C of the personal 1040 tax return that you've been filing for years probably. So sole proprietors and single member LLCs file their business taxes, income, expenses, on Schedule C of the Form 1040. So you still only have one tax return, the 1040, but now it's just got this extra Schedule C attached to it. S corporations, partnerships, and C corporations all have a separate tax return that needs to be prepared and filed. Um, and with the exception of the C corporation, those tax, those business tax returns need to be filed before you file your personal 1040 tax return. So those uh, don't. You know, I, I've seen this happen a few times where you know you start a business, you'll go and file your personal tax returns like you always have in the, in the years past, and then you'll say, okay, now I'm ready to do my my business tax return. Well, that. The information from the business tax return flows through onto your personal tax return. So you're supposed to wait to file your personal tax return until the business ones are done. All right, uh, next question. For startups, especially SaaS companies, how do assets like computers, equipment, and equipment affect our tax liabilities? Great question. So um, 
equipment purchases like computers, servers, uh, maybe even office furniture, desks, chairs, those are capital assets. And in years past, we used to have to depreciate those capital assets over a number of years. But there is, uh, there is a uh, provision in the tax law that came out in 2018 that's very favorable to small businesses, especially startups, uh, where you get to do 100% bonus depreciation of those purchases. So really, if you're a startup and you've invested a lot of money in computers and equipment, you can write all of that off in the first year by capitalizing it and then 100% bonus depreciate, doing 100% bonus depreciation on it and getting a full deduction for everything that you purchased. Even, mind you, keep note this, even if you financed it, okay, so even if you haven't paid cash for it all up front, but maybe you have a, a capital lease going on or, a, or some kind of financing plan, um, you, can, you can write the whole thing off uh, in the first year, save a lot of taxes in that year. Okay, next question. Uh, with a single member LLC, upon adding or removing a member, do all parties file the tax return or a single tax return? So a single member, so if there are two members of the LLC, then you've got a multi-member LLC, okay? And that means you've got to file a separate tax return. But if one of you leaves, then, you know, in the middle of the year, then you file a separate tax return covering January through whenever that partner left, and then you file uh, the rest of the year where you were alone on Schedule C of your personal tax return. So it gets a little complicated. You have to divide the year up into when you had multiple members and when you only had one member. When you have, and for the portion of the year when you had multiple members, you're filing a, a Form 1065 for a multi-member LLC. And for the portion of the year where you only have one member, you're filing that information on Schedule C of your 1040 personal tax return. Okay, and the 1065, when that is all done being prepared and filed, it, each owner gets a K-1 form that needs to be reported on their personal tax return as well. Okay, so hope that helps you out with that question. Throw a follow-up question in there if you need further clarification. Next question. Uh, I've got an S Corp with only me. Should the health insurance premium be paid from the business bank account? Uh, great question. Yes, it should be. And, and that's great if it is. Um, in order to get the S Corp health insurance premium benefit, uh, you should be running payroll for yourself. And that health insurance should be uh, reported on your uh, monthly or on your regular payroll payments. So you set that up in your payroll software as a health insurance premium for the S Corp owner. And you are able to, and then your W-2 comes out at the end of the year with health insurance premiums reported in box 14. And then you, if you, and if you set it up that way, then you don't have to pay income taxes on that, that health insurance benefit. But yes, uh, you should you should go ahead and pay health insurance premiums from from your S corp account. That's great. Okay, I think we've got one more question coming in here. Um, how do you decide between doing payroll for oneself or not having yourself as an employee? So, if you are the owner of a business. There's only two times that you should be a, uh, an employee of your own business. Okay. One is when you're a C corporation and two is when you're an S corporation. Okay. If you're a single member LLC, sole proprietor or multi-member LLC, you should not be on payroll. All right. 
So in, but in the other scenarios, C Corp, S Corp, uh, you're almost compelled. The S Corp, you're compelled to be. Um, and the C Corp is just beneficial to be. So um, that's probably the straightest, clearest answer of how you, you decide when to put yourself on payroll or not. It depends on your, your entity type, single member LLCs, multi-member LLCs and sole proprietors do not put yourself on payroll. S Corp, C Corp do put yourself on payroll. All right, next question. For a hybrid approach where we do our own bookkeeping and you do the tax prep, what third-party accounting software gives you the most headaches? Another way to ask, what software would you caution we stay away from? I assume QuickBooks and Wave are good softwares. Um, yeah, I, I would say any of the big names, QuickBooks, Xero, uh, Wave, I haven't been too fond of, but I but no, no issues, major issues. Really, any uh, accounting software that can generate a general ledger, a profit and loss statement, and the balance sheet is going to work for um, preparing a tax return from. Uh, the issue becomes how user-friendly the, the bookkeeping software is and how likely you are to make mistakes along the way. Um, so making sure that you understand what you're putting in the, in the software and that you're doing it accurately is more important than which software you use. So um, I would, you know, going with the big names is a good idea. Uh, Zipbooks is another good option out there if you're if you're looking for another one. Uh, so yeah, that's my two cents on that. Next question on a single member LLC or and multi-member LLC, should I give my social security number or an EIN on the W-9 form? I would give, so if a vendor, or sorry, a, a customer is asking you for a W-9 form, I would give them the EIN. So, and that links this income to the business. Um, and even, even if you are a single member LLC, I think that's best practice. Okay, so uh, definitely if you have an LLC, give them the EIN. You'd only give them the social security number if you don't have any entity formed. All right. Okay, uh, oh, maybe this is a follow-up question to that. Upon providing the social security on W-9, what happens? The single member LLC transfers from one member to another 100%. Um, you need to get that W-9 changed. So if, if the ownership of the LLC has changed, um, the, the customer should be asking for a, a new W-9 or you should be offering them a new W-9. And you can always change the W-9. And, and really any time before the end of the year, the, the customer should update, be willing to update their information before they give you a 1099 with that information on it. The W-9, the information you're putting on a W-9 is being given to this customer so that they can send you a 1099 at the end of the year. And, you, and that 1099 reports all of the income to whoever was on that W-9. And we want that income to be reported to the business. And so we put the EIN on that W-9. And yes, the business income might flow through directly to you, um, but you don't want it going to your social security number if you don't have to, because it prevents you from uh, making the S corp election later and maybe and, and sheltering that income from self employment income or other reasons. So don't panic, you know, if they've got your social security number on it, but I would recommend changing it to the EIN if possible. Okay. Next question, can a single member S Corp set up a dependent FSA? Um, a single member S Corp can set up the same FSA benefits as, as other corporations for their employees. 
Um, there are stipulations, though, in, in what fringe benefits um, are allowed for S-Corp owners. So um, I'm not sure exactly what you're implying by the dependent FSA, uh, but I believe you're talking about fringe benefits and, and a specific type of them. And I may or may know that not know that off the top of my head uh, about whether it's, that benefit is, is available to S-Corp owners. But just because an S-Corp is a single member S-Corp, uh, you can set up similar fringe benefit plans uh, as other entities can. So next question, if I received income in January before my S Corp was established, which happened in February, how should I handle the income? Uh, you should probably handle it the same as if your S Corp was established. Um, there's two ways to treat this. Uh, you can kind of, you can just, with this short period of time, if you received income just before the S Corp was established, if the substance of that transaction was meant to be included in your S Corp activity, then just put it in, just, you just make the assumption that the S Corp was intended to be in, in uh, active and established when that income came in. Um, so you don't separate it, you just treat it all as income in the S Corp. The alternative, if other circumstances require it, is basically if you had no entity formed prior to uh, when this income, you know, uh, when this income was received, then you'd carve out that period of time and report that on Schedule C as self-employment income, uh, as if you were a sole proprietor at that period of time. Um, and you'd also apply any expenses that occurred in that period of time as well, and then report the rest of the year the activity that happened after in the S Corp tax return. But again, depending on the materiality and uh, circumstances, it may just make more sense to just include it all in the S Corp tax return. Next question, if you are taxed as a pass-through entity, should business and personal be filed simultaneously? It depends on what type of pass-through entity we're talking about. So if you are a single member LLC or a sole proprietor, technically those are considered pass-through entities, uh, yes, the business activity goes on Schedule C of your personal 1040 tax return, and, it's, and then your W-2 and everything go on the 1040 tax return, and then that's all filed simultaneously at the same time. Uh, for other pass-through entities like multi-member LLCs or S-corporations, they have a different filing deadline. They have, a, they have a separate tax return and a March 15th filing deadline. So, you know, which is coming up here in a couple days. So if you haven't filed an extension for your multi-member LLC or S Corp, you need to do so right away. We've been pestering clients for information that we need in order to file extensions right now because those have to be filed by March 15th or an extension needs to be filed by March 15th and there's a separate tax return that needs to be done before you can file your personal tax return. So in that case, multi-member LLCs, S-Corp, pass-through entities, you'd be filing separately. Okay, next one. Just started my S-Corp on January 1st. It was a sole prop before. I've never charged sales tax to my business and private clients for translation services. Uh, what is the 7% tax withholding from California Franchise Tax Board that they are requesting now. 7% tax withholding from California Franchise Tax Board that they are requesting now. I'm going to have to look that one up. Um, I'm not sure what that specifically is referring to. So um, hopefully we can get, can we get an email address with that one or know who? Okay, yeah. So. We'll, we'll get an email address, and I'll, I'll, I'll look that up for you and, and give you a reply here after we're done. Uh, next question. You said bonus depreciation applies only to the first year. Is that 12 months from the start of the LLC or just only allowed in the first year the Schedule C file? 
For example, I started my single member LLC in third quarter 2019, but still buying capital equipment in 2020. So could I fully deduct my third quarter capital expenses in 19 and some from 2020? Okay, so you're going to deduct the expense in the year that you purchase them. Okay, so in the year that you purchase that capital equipment, you will record that as a deduction. You'll be able to fully depreciate, 100% bonus depreciate that in that year. So if you make some purchases in 2019, you're going to report all of those on your 2019 tax return. The 2020 purchases are going to be reported on your 2020 tax return. Okay, and, and it's it's really just in the year of purchase, all in the first year of purchase. Uh, so it doesn't really matter when when your um, entity was formed or business started. You're just deducting them in the year that you paid for them. All right, next one on the transfer of single member LLC, shall the new owner use the same EIN or the new owner request a new EIN? Great question. So when you purchase a business, there's two ways of buying a business. One is called an asset purchase where you're, you're acquiring the assets from an, an entity which might be the website, um, equipment, inventory, receivables, customer lists, a brand. So if you're just acquiring the assets from a company, then you are forming your own new entity and that, and you're just bringing these assets into your new entity and therefore you would need a new EIN for that new entity. The second way of acquiring a business is an entity sale or an entity purchase where you're actually buying the, the stock or the equity in that business. And that means you're taking the, the entity and all of the assets that are in that business and moving it into your, your personal ownership, right? And in that case, you, so the EIN, the name of the business, everything is, and all of the assets are coming along with it. So there'd be no need to have a separate entity in that case. Um, generally speaking, asset sales are better um, as far as knowing what you're getting. Um, just because if you buy an entity and, and you're buying you're buying all of their existing assets and debts and liabilities. So you may be buying an entity that owes, and that entity might owe someone you know, who knows how much money, right? If you just buy the assets, then you kind of separate yourself from that entity, and you're just taking the assets, and any obligations that they have remain with them, right? So, um, so I guess, uh, and if you don't know what, what happened, uh, if you don't know whether it was an asset sale or, or an entity purchase, um, it, it may just be an entity acquisition where they just kind of like turned everything over to you uh, to take over. And if that's the case, uh, you will need to uh, inform the state that you are now the owner of that LLC Okay, so that you are listed on the, in the state records as the, the principal owner of that LLC. And so they attach your information to that EIN and to that entity. All right. Okay, hopefully that helps there. That's a, that's a big topic, um, even if, unfortunately, even if it's a small business and, and uh, maybe even not a lot of money's involved, um, it's kind of a, a big topic. All right, next question. CT6, why would you file this and what are the benefits for a single member S Corp? I will have to look that one up too. I'm not sure, out of, out of, out of context, I, I can't, maybe you can provide a little bit more context of the CT6. I don't doubt that it's a form, but I can't pull it out of my brain right now. Next one, you are an excellent, Communicator, can you be my accountant? <laughs> hey, I, I thank you 
Um, I am currently not taking on new clients uh, directly, um, but I'm uh, working with all of our tax accountants and trying to help them be better communicators and be as good of a tax professional as possible. Uh, if I would love to meet you because you complimented me so well, but uh, I, I'm not taking on clients directly, but wouldn't mind having an email exchange or, or talking to you if you'd like. Next one, do you think there's a chance you will have another webinar in a few weeks before the April 15th tax deadline? Actually, yeah, we do have another webinar scheduled intentionally on April 13th, uh, right before the, the tax deadline. I imagine we will have a long list of questions in that one. Um, and, but I think between now and then we're doing um, additional just Q&A webinars where we don't go into as deep of a topic and we spend more time just answering questions. Uh, so look out for, for those. I'm pretty sure one or two of those will be happening between now and, and that April 13th webinar. Okay, looks like we got a couple more last questions here. Uh, thanks for your answer. Does the single member LLC EIN tie to the single mem uh, member owner social security number? Um, yes, the, the IRS and the state uh, want to know who is the owner of a, of a specific EIN. They want to know the person. And so when you update the records to show that you are the owner of that LLC, they're linking your social security number and EIN together so that they can um, track, you know, track you better, I guess you could say, um, and make sure you're filing everything you should be. All right. Oh, good. So election by a federal, so the CT6 treated as a, okay. Uh, the CT6 must be uh, the New York S-Corp election. So the, the federal S-Corp election is, is typically done on a Form 2553. Um, but I, based on this question, I'm assuming that the New York S-Corp election is the CT6. Can we go back to that question where they reference the CT? Why would you file this and what are the benefits for being a single member S-Corp? Okay, so... Yeah, so S-Corps can be a really great uh, entity for saving taxes. Um, in a nutshell, the profits from an S-Corporation are not subject to FICA taxes, Social Security and Medicare taxes, okay, which make up 15%. Profits from... Uh, multi-member LLCs or single-member LLCs or sole proprietors generally are subject to FICA taxes. So all things equal, uh, you will pay more taxes with uh, a single-member LLC, multi-member LLC, or sole proprietorship strictly because of that, that fact that the IRS just has uh, – exempted or allowed S-Corp profits to, be, to not be subject to FICA taxes. The consideration there is that when you make the S-Corp election, you are compelled, the IRS requires you to put yourself as the owner on payroll of your own entity so that you have to start paying yourself payroll of a reasonable compensation, they call it, uh, from the entity to yourself. And, and all of the payroll that you pay to yourself is subject to FICA taxes. But the savings come from the fact that you don't have to pay yourself everything through payroll. Okay, You can justify taking owner's distributions, so like dividends, from the S Corp as well, so that now you're taking some out through payroll, a reasonable compensation through payroll, and then you're taking the rest of your compensation out as an owner's distribution. Payroll subject to FICA taxes, 
owner's distributions, not subject to FICA taxes. So you're still getting, you're getting tax, significant tax savings on that owner's distribution portion. So that's, that's it in a, in a quick nutshell. Check out our video on the boot camp if you sign into your, your, your portal. Uh, there's a boot camp tab, uh, tab over there with a list of videos. Click on the understanding, the S Corp one, and watch that. I think it's like five, five minutes or less long, and that maybe will help solidify those principles in your, in your mind. But ultimately, it's about saving taxes. Next one. In the case of opening an LLC at the end of the year with no sales or purchases, filing the tax return for that year is mandatory. Uh, not if you are a single member LLC. If, if you're a single member LLC, no filing is required. If you are a multi-member LLC, then you've got more than one owner in the LLC. And generally speaking, yes, there is a requirement to file even if it's a zero tax return. Okay. Uh, next question, is the separate form needed for bonus depreciation or is that just included in Schedule C? It's a separate form. Uh, form 4562 is the depreciation form that is generated when you're uh, recording capital asset purchases and depreciating them. Okay, I think that brings us to the end here. Great questions. Thank you for for sharing. I'm, I hope I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, the we the webinar will be emailed out to everyone who is registered and of course uploaded to our social media websites. Uh, we've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel for more information. I mentioned a couple videos that we have posted there. Uh, and subscribe to that, of course, so that you can always get the most recent webinar that we're doing. Um, I mentioned earlier we, we do monthly kind of deeper dive webinars and then a couple uh, that are webinars that are focused just on the Q&A. Uh, the, next, the next monthly webinar is on April 13th, as I mentioned. Uh, if you haven't, if, if you're here as a, as a non-Mazuma member, uh, definitely check us out. Um, our bookkeeping and tax services are subscription based. So, you know, you pay a flat monthly fee, which is about as affordable of a fee as, as it gets uh, to, to get our services. Uh, our focus is just on small business, right? So we are laser focused on micro business, small business issues. And we are really good at, at helping our small business owners out. We do the bookkeeping, the monthly reconciliation, tax planning, uh, if you subscribe to that, as well as a tax return preparation and filing uh, for both personal, on both the personal side and the business tax return side. All right, and you can find all the information on our website at mazumausa.com. Thanks for joining today, and we'll see you next time.